Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Texas Biomed Global Health Symposium. My name is Dr. Sarah Trampoda, and I'm a board-certified anesthesiologist and interventional pain physician at Advantage Pain Management. Today, I am pleased to be moderating the session on non-communicable diseases, also known as NCDs, and chronic conditions. What is the impact of infectious diseases on NCDs? I'm so excited to be joined by four incredible speakers who will share their insights and expertise on the impact of infectious disease, including COVID, on other diseases such as cancer, heart disease, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and more. During the COVID pandemic, we saw an increased risk of infection amongst people living with NCDs. This panel will explore policies, practices, programs, and treatments towards preventing and controlling risk factors, especially for countries and populations most vulnerable to the impacts of pandemics and infectious disease. I am joined by Amy Israel, Vice President and Global Head, Oncology Policy and Health Systems Novartis, where she leads environmental shaping and system strengthening efforts to drive access for cancer care. Amy joined Novartis in 2018 and she leads global health and Sub-Saharan Africa public affairs and has spent the past 20 years designing evidence-based programs for at-risk communities in dozens of countries across all regions, spanning private sector, government, and non-government organizations. Ms. Israel has had numerous committee and advisory roles with entities such as the WHO, the NCD Roundtable, the NCD Alliance, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and the Global Health Council. She currently sits on the board of the International Council of AIDS Service Organizations. Israel holds a Master of Social Work and Community Organizing from the University of Michigan. Welcome, Amy. We also are pleased to introduce Dr. William Martin. He's a senior advisor to the Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Martin has substantial expertise in both academia and in governmental scientific administration. As a pulmonary and critical care physician scientist, he has authored more than 175 research and clinical papers. Prior to joining NIH, he was an NIH-funded principal investigator for nearly 25 years. His professional service includes being president of the American Thoracic Society, president of the American Lung Association of Indiana, a member of the Advisory Council for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and a health policy fellow for the U.S. Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee. Dr. Martin's clinical background, combined with his expertise in academia and government leadership, has served him well in his role at UIC. Welcome, Dr. Martin. I'd also be pleased to introduce Dr. Alexis Wiesenthal. She's an internal medicine physician at Wiesenthal Internal Medicine. She's also a board certified doctor of internal medicine and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. She specializes in comprehensive patient care. Dr. Wiesenthal completed residency at the Mayo Clinic and follows their tenet that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. Her practice focuses on preventative medicine, wellness, and longevity. She specializes in outpatient internal medicine, diagnostics, and primary care for adults. Dr. Wiesenthal applies science and clinical ex expertise to diagnose, treat, and provide compassionate care of adults across the spectrum from preventative care to complex issues. Dr. Wiesenthal also serves on the board of the Founders Council, which supports Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Founders Council also supports interventions of new treatments for common medical conditions that affect all of us, including the fight to create new vaccines, such as the COVID-19 vaccine. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shelley Cole. She's a professor here at Texas Biomed. Dr. Cole studies the genetic risk for developing common complex diseases. She collaborates on genetic studies of minority population groups that have very high rates of metabolic and other diseases yet are traditionally underrepresented in genetic and medical research. A special focus of Dr. Cole's work is on preserving and promoting the utility and potential of the Strong Heart Study. The Strong Heart Study is a national resource for research studies to ultimately reduce the prevalence and incidence of metabolic-related disease and to improve public health in general in the American Indian population. 
Dr. Cole has more than 25 years of expertise studying human genetics. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this panel. Ms. Israel, I'd like to ask you to start us off and share some of your thoughts on the impact of the pandemic on NCDs, healthcare systems, quality of care, and more. What were some of the things you saw during the pandemic, and what are some of the lessons learned? Thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be uh, partaking in this panel. And I also want to recognize that I'm on lots, we all go to lots of events and uh, panels, and I rarely see majority uh, female representation. And so uh, it's really nice to, um, to see the diversity here. And um, so I'm going to start by setting the stage on NCDs, talking a little bit about financing, moving towards solutions, and then I wouldn't be a good advocate if I didn't end with a call to action. So the proportion of global health funding dedicated to NCDs has always been extremely low compared to the disease burden. In 2019, it reached its peak at 2.1% only of the funding. That's the highest it's ever been. And clearly, uh, after the pandemic hit, then it went down. Investors and funders are attracted to acute care conditions that can be addressed in a once and done type of approach uh, with almost immediate reportable impact. And that's just not possible with NCDs. And yet, even a small investment, if spent wisely, could have immense impact. WHO released a report in December 2021 saying that just 84 cents per person would prevent 7 million deaths between now and 2030. Um, so it is doable. There are some creative ideas emerging to support stronger and sustainable financing, um, such as blended financing, investing in uh, health startups in low and middle income countries. So there are some creative ideas that go towards a multi-sector approach as well. Let me take a step back and talk about the NCD targets and where we are. Even before the pandemic, we were already missing these targets. There was an analysis looking at trends through 2016, only 17 of 176 countries were on track to reach their NCD goals for women, and only 15 countries out of 176 were on track to reach their goals for men for NCDs. And with the exception of South Korea, all of these countries were quite small with small populations. Now, bringing the pandemic, we saw the suspension of so many screening and treatment services for NCDs, rightfully so, um, but this has only exacerbated the situation. In US alone, 9.4 million people missed screenings for breast cancer, colon, prostate cancer between March and May of 2020. In regional Japan, the rate of colonoscopies, this one is gonna take a little while to get the aha moment. It took me a while when I read this, but this study, the rate of, colon, of positive colonoscopies after a positive fecal immunochemistry test. Okay, so they got the test and then they had to go for follow-up. In 2019 was 72.3%. Uh, so 72% were, were going for the colonoscopy. In 2020 was 19%. People are not getting the follow-up. So, but this is not only about, just about delayed services, there's real and chilling consequences to this. Um, in Britain, it's projected that about 4,000 women are going to shift from having early screening detected cancers to having symptomatic cancers. The result of this is potentially 687 additional breast cancer deaths. We need smart investment in health post or during COVID, which should prioritize NCDs in order to address the backlog in services, but also because building resilient health systems is about building systems that can absorb the short-term stressors such as COVID and the long-term stressors such as NCDs. The US CDC uh, Division of Global Health Pro Protection has specifically proposed strengthening pandemic preparedness through NCD strategies. 
They've identified key areas where addressing NCDs could reduce our vulnerability to the pandemic, to such pandemics. For instance, strengthening workforce and laboratory services or committing to sustainable financing would address NCDs now, but then also develop better preparedness for infectious threats over the long term. One good news nugget is that just this month, a new global compact on NCDs was launched. Now we have continued heads of state, but even more heightened attention, acknowledging that NCDs must be tackled urgently, incorporating uh, incorporated into universal health care strategies. And they also recognize that NCDs is one of the keys to health system resilience against future pandemics. Let's shift briefly towards solutions. Investment cannot be geared towards redesigning healthcare delivery um, alone by just throwing funding at it. It can't be only looking at geographic disparities. We need to look at maximizing the health outcomes. We need to look at um, ensuring that interventions can be measured and sustainable. That means, for instance, investing in standardized quality diagnostic tests that can find what they're looking for. An example, in Latin America, studies have reported pap smear tests with sensitivity below 25%. So people are going for their pap smear, but the sensitivity for the test is below 25%. They're missing treatable cases of cervical cancer. Uh, clearly a call for the quality diagnostic component Investing in system tools that speed up time to diagnosis and time from diagnosis to treatment. Less than 20% of development assistance for health in 2020 was spent on health system strengthening. And over half of that was on COVID response. We need to take a whole systems multidisciplinary approach and eliminate the silos that trap us into financing access aspects of care in buckets and block us from measuring true impact of interventions. Um, in many countries, I, uh, laboratory services are designed around detection of infectious pathogens. In Ethiopia, they found that broadening the remit of laboratories through standardized national logistics system reduced patient wait times for tests from months to less than 24 hours. So it is doable. Uh, I, I'm going to end with my call to action and some examples. We must have a health in all um, policies. Investment in health cannot occur in the health budget silo alone. Policies, these health in all policies should be the aim in which, with which investment health for health permeates multiple areas, acknowledging the links from inequities to social determinants of health to achieving better health outcomes to driving better economic potential through higher participation in the workforce, which then ultimately creates the more efficient tax base, a higher, more efficient tax base to support health and welfare programs. I'll see, you know, one example of this is the reignited U.S. cancer moonshot, where the cancer cabinet includes not only all the federal health agencies, but also the departments of defense, energy and agriculture and EPA, et cetera. Or, an example where I know at Novartis that we supported and helped contribute to in Portugal, working with a broader coalition to drive change that links health with wealth in ways that's meaningful for patients in Portugal resulted in a legislative amendment for the Portuguese employment code, which passed in September, 2019, granting greater employment protection to patients with cancer and parents of children with cancer who have to take time off. So this notion of health in all policies is quite critical for um, the improvement of NCD care uh, across the globe. Food for thought, and I look forward to uh, the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I'm really inspired hearing the points you share on how we can improve resiliency and build better healthcare systems. On that topic, Dr. Wiesenthal, would you please share your thoughts on what you saw during the pandemic in your practice as a physician? 
Absolutely. Hi, I'm Alexis Wiesenthal, Internal Medicine. I'm here from San Antonio, and I'm on the board with Sarah for the Founders Council and have really enjoyed um, these two days at the Global Health Symposium and also um, everything that I've learned through Texas Biomed and being part of the Founders Council and uh, the intersection between infectious disease and communities and uh, its effect on non-communicable diseases. Um, as a primary care doctor, that is um, my bread and butter, is helping people um, be their strongest that they can and their healthiest that they can and managing uh, non-communicable diseases such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, things like fatty liver, which Texas Biomed studies in particular because we have a whole lot of it here in San Antonio. Um, there is a lot of intersection uh, between infectious disease and non-communicable diseases, and we can't really separate them out um, because there are, you know, oncogenic uh, viruses or viruses that ca can cause cancer, like uh, HPV or uh, um, cytomegalovirus or EBV and things like that. So it's been very interesting um, to uh, experience the COVID uh, pandemic from a primary care standpoint. Um, I just remember kind of the rug being taken out from under me um, after I had spent about an hour on uh, just a wellness visit with a patient. Um, it was late February or early March, and we went through everything, you know, like, is she up to date on her vaccinations? How's her sleep? What's her diet like? What's her joyful movement? What does she do for exercise? And um, you know, screening for depression. Did she do her mammogram? She's over 45. Has she had her colonoscopy? What sort of heart testing has she had? When were her last labs? Things like that. Just like an hour together. Um, and then at the end of it, she's like, well, I've been processing people from Wuhan, China and testing them for COVID-19. I think everything we talked about with my allergies and everything you prescribed for my allergies is going to be great. But um, now I'm wondering, like, could I have COVID-19 and can you test me for that? And I was just like, oh, my goodness. Let, let me get six feet from you. <laughs> I know. And I, I, I always wore a mask if a patient came in for an acute illness. But at that time, she was there for a well check. Um, and I, I mean, my face just must have like turned white. And I was like, I'll be right back. And I went and got like my N95 and my white coat. And, um, and that's kind of when my world changed. And um, I had heard about telehealth and I'm involved in the Texas Medical Association and they had kept, um, doing talks on telehealth and how to incorporate telehealth into your practice. And I remember thinking like, I don't need to go to that talk. I'm going to go to this other one on, you know, diagnosing of cancers or something. Um, but all of a sudden, uh, my life was uh, helping people with acute illnesses and COVID um, when, when I had been concentrating on uh, preventative care and wellness and um, obesity management and things like that. So um, it was very different as a practice model for me um, to um, almost become an infectious disease doctor overnight, uh, to become like an urgent care clinic, an acute care clinic, when I had been, uh, I, I started practice in 2009. And most of my patients I've had, you know, for 10 or 12 years. Um, and so the trust that I had built over the years with those patients was really helpful when it came to us all being in the dark on uh, how to treat COVID, what this was, what this meant for um, all of us, and discussing vaccine hesitancy um, and the importance of controlling uh, the non-communicable diseases that we can control. Um, and just feeling really grateful that I had laid that groundwork um, with my patients to help for preventing uh, the, the worst COVID. So a lot of the um, inflammatory cytokine uh, cascade that happens with COVID affects um, people who are already at risk for uh, disease. Um, a lot of uncontrolled diabetes and uh, chronic kidney disease, chronic respiratory conditions, um, they're already high inflammatory states. Um, people with cancers, 
exposed to COVID, they have um, cellular fatigue. You know, their body's already fighting these other diseases. So there's certain um, down regulation of uh, protective cells in people who have diabetes. Um, you can get T cell fatigue uh, with uh, hematologic cancers uh, when exposed with COVID. And so um, it, it, NCDs can set up a person for worsening outcomes, you know, morbidity and mortality, death, um, ending up in the hospital. So I was really excited to get in there. And even though I didn't know how this was going to pan out or, you know, what I could do to help, I wanted to stay steadfast to evidence-based medicine. And that was really important um, in speaking with um, people who uh, were calling in for, you know, can I just go ahead and get a supply of hydroxychloroquine or can I get a supply of um, ivermectin? Um, uh, I'm taking high doses of zinc and vitamin D or whatever. Um, so it, it, it was a lot of... Um, just kind of switched to talking about COVID all the time. Um, telemedicine just made things so accessible um, for, for patients. Um, I could get a phone call um, and see somebody at the end of the phone call. I would say, can I send you a link right now? Um, they'd be like, absolutely. And uh, you know, throughout the pandemic, it was such a relief to finally get treatments that were improving mortality. Um, but I could, I could see a patient, and while I was talking to them and putting in their symptoms, have them set up for um, one of the infusions at, um, at one of the centers run by STRAC uh, by, by the end of our visit. Um, and so the kind of emergency care um, that telehealth was able to offer. Um, just in management of non-communicable uh, diseases with patients, I've really enjoyed being in patients' homes, uh, meeting their dog, you know, like things that, things that I would never have known about these people who've been coming to my office for 10 years, you know, and they're always, you know, dressed perfectly and, you know, very... Now they're talking to you on there in bed. Formal, yeah. <laughs> There was one girl who was getting her eyebrows waxed. I was like, we'll have to have this call another time. Um, but um, I, I feel so much closer to my patients and I know more um, where they're coming from. And uh, I, I think the accuracy of care can be greater too. Um, you know, what medications are you on? You know, that little white pill, just the, the round one, you know, that one. Um, Take me to your medicine cabinet. Like, let's look at it. And they're showing you it in the Zoom, and yeah. the, you're trying to read it. Like, uh, your your kidney functions way up. Like, what's going on? Like, well, I just got this giant thing of protein powder from Costco. Like, let's read what's in that. You know, um, and just really learning learning people's um, ins and outs, and then also training at Mayo. One of the things that um, they recommended. Uh, as standard of care is not wearing a white coat and that it was a um, a barrier to uh, you know honest and um, democratic uh, communication with with um, providing care and I I feel like the medical office is kind of like a white coat um, and you know you have to come and park and wait in the waiting room and wait for the doctor to walk in and you know it's this this big ordeal but with telemedicine there's a patient who needs you there you are it's right there and it's like almost removing the uh, the the white coat i just feel um really good about being able to um serve people where they are um, and then the trust that I can offer as a primary care doctor who, you know, I've had these connections with people for a long time um, and recommending uh, care during the pandemic and uh, obviously vaccination um, has been great because there's nothing greater than the speed of trust. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wiesenthal.
Um, I, I like what you said about uh, serving people where they are. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, just to kind of go with what she's talking about, um, telemedicine in, in, in my practice too is, is great because we have a lot of people in rural communities um, and uh, some socioeconomic uh, you know, difficulties, gas is expensive, they can't get a ride. So it really opens a lot of doors to be able to serve people where they are. I really like that. Uh, those words that you used. Um, and um, with that, we will go on. Next, we are actually going to talk to Dr. Uh, Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin, yes. it, we are ready to hear from you. Dr. Martin, from a physician scientist perspective, have there been any important areas, uh, risk factors, or diseases that have been overlooked in studies? Uh, yes, I would say certainly, and I think what is not discussed enough in the context of risk for infection and non-communicable disease are environmental exposures, which can accelerate both, but can also accelerate the interaction. Okay, I got into this entire field by accident. I was a traditional academic physician, spent 14 years at Mayo Clinic, 14 years at Indiana University, directing the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, as Dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Cincinnati. And then on August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Waveland, Mississippi. I volunteered as, uh, to, uh, to participate uh, with Project Hope on the Navy hospital ship, The Comfort. And after two months of working in Mississippi under conditions I had never seen in my life, I came away puzzled as a scientist and as a human being about what am I doing in academic medicine? I need to understand global health. I need to understand what I've just experienced. So I joined NIH, who I'm very familiar with, and I was associate director of both the NIEHS, focused on the environment, and eventually NICHD, which focused on women and children. I say that because I think the environment and its impact on women and children is critical to the discussion of infection and non-communicable disease. The point I want to illustrate is that for three billion people on the planet, live on about a dollar or two a day. Life is very different than in middle and high income countries. And the most egregious environmental exposure is the indoor burning of solid fuels, known as household air pollution. I go through a lot of details, but I'm gonna show you a quick video. And that video is from Lancet. And I was commissioned to write a paper for Lancet and when this was published, they created this video to highlight the topic for the general public. So if that could be shown. Household air pollution is now the number one environmental cause of death in the world. According to the World Health Organization, around one-third of the world's population use solid fuels derived from plant material primarily for cooking. These fuels are often used in an open fire or traditional stove that result in significant household air pollution. Women and children are both particularly vulnerable to the toxic effects of the pollution and are also exposed to the highest concentrations. It is a major cause of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in non-smoking women and an attributable risk factor in the deaths of around half a million children under five years old from acute lower respiratory tract infections. Household air pollution is also linked to adverse pregnancy outcomes including low birth weight and stillbirth. In 2010 it was responsible for 3.9 million premature deaths and 4.8% of lost healthy life years. In order to reduce household air pollution, multiple strategies are required to meet the needs of such households. These include more efficient stoves, cleaner fuels, solar power and improved ventilation. To find out more, go to thelancet.com. Thank you. So I want to click through some slides. Household air pollution is not a cartoon. This is real life in Kenya. I could show you identical photos in the highlands of Peru or Guatemala, in South Asia, 
anywhere where there is severe poverty. You notice the other set of eyes looking over the right shoulder of this woman uh, cooking a meal. There's another component to this. I'm going to just run through this, but it's collecting fuel. You might think that this is not a big deal. It's actually sort of idyllic to look at this. But these women and children who go out to collect fuel are at high risk for violence. And this happens everywhere because of deforestation. They have to work far, walk farther and farther to collect fuel. So it may involve wild dogs, snakes, scorpions, but as Aaron Patrick pointed out at a side meeting at the UN General Assembly meeting, I participated in men. So Dr. Achebe yesterday, when he talked about global health solution, he, he said, forget the men, focus on women. I agree with that entirely, but I would add to Dr. Achebe's comment, focus on women and children. If you want to have an impact in the world to reduce NCDs and risk of infection, that should be your target. Quickly, this is just a, a I've served in uh, Haiti a number of times, but this is what Haiti looks like from the sky. The DR next door has a high quality forestry management. Haiti has none. So when you serve in Haiti and you're caught in a sort of a monsoon rainstorm, Port-au-Prince after the earthquake was just a sea of mud because there, is, there are no trees to hold back uh, the water and it depends on charcoal for their, for their cooking. The health impacts contributing to the 4 million, as mentioned in the video, low birth weight, perinatal mortality, acute pneumonia. Also notice otitis media tuberculosis. And then the chronic, the NCDs, include asthma, COPD, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease. I did ask the question about COVID-19 progression. There are no studies with household air pollution, but we often borrow from exposure of ambient air pollution. And a study published in one of our respiratory journals at the end of uh, or in 2022, notice an odds ratio of about 1.1, which is not great, but note that it is per mic one microgram exposure to PM 2.5. So the national standards for air quality are normally about 35. So you might say, well, what if it's 40? Or what if it's 50? And all of a sudden that odds ratio is increasing to high levels. But what if it is household air pollution, which is typ typically 100 times higher than the national air quality standards used by countries all over the world? A hundredfold. So the exposure of the poorest people on our planet is massive. And trust me, they are not seeing healthcare systems, they are not receiving pharmaceuticals, they have no exposure except to an occasional healthcare worker that may or may not visit their village or deep inside the urban environment of major cities in low and middle income countries. So I can't ask, answer the question at the bottom, but my bet is there is a massive impact on COVID mortality. As mentioned in the slide, I just want to highlight that the household air pollution accounts for almost one in three of the 1.8 million children who die every year of acute pneumonia. And that is more than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. And as noted, there are many ways to treat and prevent pneumonia. But Maria Nira from the WHO, a plain spoken woman, if ever there were one, who's director of the Department of Public Health and Environment said, the best vaccine for pneumonia is ensuring that kids don't breathe dirty air at home. So how do you reduce household air pollution if you want to impact risk of infection or NCDs? You can change the cook stove, improve the efficiency of the cook stove or the heating source. You could change the fuel. You could go from biomass and the biomass is going to be wood, crop residues, tr paper trash, um, 
and coal, or you could bring in LPG. It's a very clean gas. Uh, NIH is studying this, as I'll mention later. <clears throat> or you can improve the ventilation of the house, open the windows. You could use a chimney, but chimneys are not used because they have to be clean. And they can't be three stories high like we might have in our homes here. They're virtually ineffective in a village setting. Or you could have removal of the kitchen from living areas. Or you could try all four in one form or another. From these slides, it really uh, it represents nearly 40 years of work on uh, household air pollution. But I want to highlight the role of Kirk Smith, who is the father of the field. Visiting Guatemala for the first time in 1984, he said, this is crazy. How do families live like this with household air pollution? And in 1984, he proposed the first cook stove intervention, but it was not funded until 2001. The institute I work for, NIEHS, as associate director, and a decade later, that funded study demonstrated that cook stove intervention markedly reduces the risk of acute pneumonia in children under the age of two. It was a landmark study that generated further RCTs in Nepal, Ghana, and Malawi. And as part of my, I spent seven years at NIH after my uh, decision to join um, while I was on, a, on this Navy hospital ship. And during that time, we partnered with EPA, with the CDC, with the Department of Ag and Department of Energy and USAID. We created a trans-US government uh, process that was unique at the time. And we built about $50 million in funding to support household air pollution within the government. Unfortunately, in March of 2013, uh, there, the debt ceiling was not met. It triggered a mandatory freeze and cut in the federal budgets for all agencies. And uh, I would say half of that money disappeared overnight. But the commitment was restored in 15, 16, and 17. And now we have the Happen trial being funded by NIH and with the partners of the Gates Foundation, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, and the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease. And now there is an LPG stove intervention in more than 3,000 homes in four countries, including Rwanda, India, Peru, and Guatemala, to assess, to, to see if they can replicate Kirk Smith's study using LPG. Technology has changed markedly we now have stoves available in markets around the world because of work we're doing with uh, the International Standards Organization and a meeting at The Hague that I participated in. Um, we have standards for cook stove manufacturing. And so you can buy a stove in Africa, in India, that's almost like the EPA star rating. Is it a good quality stove? Will it prevent serious disease in my, in, in my family. The real trick, and I think when you think of trying to scale problems, focus on infectious disease and non-communicable disease, you need to build a sustainable structure. I was fortunate to be in the US government and with my par partners, Jacob Moss at, at EPA and Vic Capil at CDC, we were able to work with our respective leaders to help create the U within the UN Foundation this new not-for-profit called the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. It has, in the first four years, generated $500 million. It has 600 partners, including 80 countries. And it has continued to facilitate this trans-government interaction within the US government, as well as with governments around the world. Uh, I want to have a shout out to Francis Collins, who made all of this happen within NIH. If you can't convince your leadership, uh, it's hard to scale. It's hard to work across uh, 
government borders. And Gina McCarthy at EPA was the leader who made this happen at EPA. And then Secretary Clinton made this the centerpiece of our global partnership initiative. This could not, the global alliance could not have occurred without the commitment of Secretary Clinton. And she said at her retirement uh, from the Secretary of State role that she never talked to a government leader and didn't ask the question, what are you doing for the women, the poor women and children in your country? And specifically, what are you doing about household air pollution? So in brief summary, household air pollution in low and middle income countries involves 3 billion people who still cook and heat their homes with biomass fuels or coal. A half a million children die of acute pneumonia attributable to household air pollution every year. And hundreds of millions of non-smoking women are developing COPD and cardiovascular disease. And today, as for the last 45 years, when Kirk Smith first became involved with this, we need to develop and implement newer, efficient, safe, and affordable cooking and heating solutions to prevent loss of millions of lives every year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. You've highlighted some very important points, and we appreciate your input. This has also brought up another important question of environmental impacts, and I wonder what other factors are at play. I'd like to turn to Dr. Cole and hear what your thoughts are. As a researcher in genetic epidem epidemiologic studies, what have you seen in communities? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. A lot of what I'm going to say echoes what you've heard before from this panel and um, in this symposium. Um, as you stated before in your, uh, in your introduction, I'm a basic researcher. I do research on risk factors for metabolic disease, and my focus is on inherited risk factors. Um, these involve partnering with underserved communities, communities that have basically been left out of research in the past. Um, the, I also work in a highly collaborative environment. I do team science. Um, the projects involve multiple institutions with many investigators at those institutions with many different, uh, uh, from many different disciplines and a lot of different um, expertise. Um, and we try to partner with our communities to do community-based research, community-informed research, um, and try to address um, topics that they consider to be very important. So the Strong Heart Study, that, for which I'm involved in, um, they work, um, we're looking uh, at trying to decrease risk of heart disease and type 2 diabetes in the communities because those are our major problems um, in underserved communities like American Indians. Um, early on in the pan, well, we've known for a long time when we talk about metabolic disease and we talk about heart disease, type 2 diabetes, stroke, um, we know early on for probably over 30 years that inflammation, chronic inf low level inflammation, is a risk factor for many metabolic diseases. Um, we also know that metabolic diseases are associated with chronic inflammation and that maybe metabolic diseases or the beginnings of metabolic disease such as obesity might induce that chronic inflammation. Um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic made the world aware that metabolic disease, um, that because people who were obese, very early on the data showed people who were obese or had type 2 B type 2 diabetes were two of the groups that were most vulnerable to the worst effects from having COVID-19. Um, we know that, as I said, metabolic disease puts you at a higher risk of complications or severe disease, but we also know now, based on data that's coming out now, that people who've had COVID-19 are now at a higher risk for um, being diagnosed with new heart disease or diabetes. And I expect that's going to continue and is going to add to the healthcare burden everywhere and especially for underserved communities that have some of the highest rates of infection from COVID-19. So moving forward in our studies of metabolic disease, we need to really take into account 
infectious disease because that's another risk factor. So when we do our studies, we, we want to try to identify novel risk factors. In order to do that, we have to account for the impact of known risk factors to kind of tease out and clear up whatever signal we might get from our studies for novel risk factors. So we collect a lot of extensive data on exercise and diet and BMI and history of, you know, high blood pressure um, and smoking and, and other aspects that are well-known risk factors for heart disease and other diseases. Well, now we have to collect extensive data on exposure to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And since we aren't we're, at, we're not at a point yet where we fully understand what's going on. We have to collect a lot of data because we can't go back and we need to collect the data now and we need to anticipate that there may be something that is discovered in the future and we won't have the data to check it out. The other thing that has happened um, is that um, we know that during the pandemic, many people were not able to get their normal health care. Healthcare is a problem in underserved communities to begin with. And even though there are things like telehealth and other things available, most of the communities or a lot of the communities that we work with don't have that. They might not have cell phones. If they have cell phones, they might not have cell service all the time. They don't have smartphones. They don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet. So, or the Wi-Fi is super spotty, and you can't can't hold a Zoom conversation or a right. duo conversation with them. Yeah, and so, um, so during this time, during the pandemic, a lot of people were not getting the health care they needed to deal with their chronic conditions, and they may have gotten worse or put them at a much higher risk. So, as we continue to do studies with our communities, we need to collect information. Um, detailed information on whether or not they received health care during the pandemic. The other thing um, that has happened is funding um, the National Institutes of Health, which as you know, is one of the biggest funders of biomedical research in this country. They were given a large bolus of money um, from the federal government when the pandemic hit to do studies. Um, on COVID-19, um, and they used that. They had a really well outlined plan of how to distribute funds, um, um, award grants to to study everything from um, community engagement to developing therapies and um, treatments, uh, better treatments um, and prevention for COVID-19. Um, and to study the mechanism of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, and uh, the, the Institute, the National Heart, Lung, and Institute, NHLBI, the one that funds the Strong Heart Study and other studies I've been involved with mainly, um, they, one of their um, goals was to put together a collaborative or a consortium of their long-term cohort studies. So the Strong Heart Study of American Indians has been going on for more than 30 years, and that's just one of uh, multiple studies that NHLBI has funded, long-term studies. Some of you may have heard of the Framingham Heart Study. That's another one. Um, these are studies that have been going on for a very long time to collect information on risk factors um, for heart disease and lung disease. And they've been sponsored by NHLBI. So NHLBI awarded a grant for 14 of these cohort studies and including the Strong Heart Study, to collect information on COVID-19, to administer surveys, to see whether or not somebody had been diagnosed, to get their medical records, review them, collect data on how severe their infection was. And because these are long-term studies, we have data prior to the pandemic we can use to help inform risk factors for severe disease. And we also are continuing to see these studies through other funding. We're continuing to see participants and do studies so we can collect additional data post the pa post pandemic. So this is gonna be a valuable data source um, to use in the future going forward. So we're very fortunate that we, um, we're a part, that the Strong Heart Study is a part of that. Dr. Cole, they're giving me the sign that we have to go to questions now. Okay. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem, um, I was well, done. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your words. 
Um, we're going to take questions both from the virtual audience in the Q&A chat box and also the audience here in the room. So I'd like to start here in the room. Please raise your hand and share your questions into the microphone. Uh, Ryan has a microphone for you. We just got to get that microphone on just momentarily. Uh, my question is, yesterday we were discussing trust and how the lack of trust in the medical community and lack of trust in certain programs has led people away from trusting the vaccines and trusting even testing at this point and um, how misinformation has spurred this whole thing on. When the research is being done, is that something that's, that they're trying to take into account? The fact that for underserved communities, there are reasons why mistrust is running rampant that never got addressed over the last several decades and still doesn't really get addressed now so that we can begin to get people who are actually going to come out and be, and be able to trust the science instead of being told that the science is fake if it's something that they don't agree with. I think um, I'm going to go ahead and take part of that question then I'm going to ask the other um, uh, Panels. I think one of the biggest thing is that you that the that physicians that are seeing patients, with the researchers are doing such a great job with it. But I think physicians has to have to also advocate and be that intermediate inter, intermediate between patients and their communities. Um, we have patients in clinic all the time that uh, sometimes, like I'll take patients, uh, they'll have injections in my office, or like we need to go to the surgery center. The surgery center requires. Um, either vaccination or COVID testing prior to entry. And there's patients who don't trust the COVID test, so they don't go to the surgery centers. So guess what? They're not getting that care because there may be certain procedures that we can only do at the surgery center. So what you're talking about is we see it all the time in our, in our practice. So we can tell them, we, we, you know, and we can try and educate them. But I think we have to, that as physicians, um, I, I will also like Alexis' opinion. We need to advocate to, to open up those conversations. And when they, when my patients tell me that, I don't shut them down and say like that's untrue. You know, that you have a right to your opinion, and then we can try and educate as much as possible. Um, and I just think we, we can't ever stop being advocates to to connect with the communities in that way. Alexis, yeah, there's such a um, strong history of racism and uh, sexism and. Uh, homophobia and and um, uh, people who are underserved populations, um, uh, people who have been used for experiments, um, and uh, a lot of distrust in the medical community uh, with that historical data uh, that we can't ignore. And so, um, like I was talking about meeting people where they are, so um, not everybody I uh, have as a patient is on the same page as me. And um, that's, that's one of the challenges as a physician is meeting people where they are and trying to understand um, the, you know, the historical significance of where they're coming from. And um, knowing people over a long period of time, I think, helps build that trust. Um, but also just honest and open communication, allowing people to ask questions trying to be transparent as much as possible, um, letting people know where I've gotten my data and why I believe in it and um, what's medical evidence-based. Um, and uh, it's a challenge for sure. Dr. Cole, you have some thoughts? Yes, um, so the, the uh, American Indians, of course, have a great mistrust of the federal government as well as um, um, a scientist because abuses have occurred in the past. And so for the over 30 years, the Strong Heart Study has been partnering with the participating tribes um, to develop trust. Um, and that's been, and that happens on many, many levels. Uh, a lot of community engagement. Um, one of the things that the Strong Heart Study has done is capacity building and training and um, training native investigators, but also training health aides and uh, recruiters and field staff who actually come from the community. So they hire from the community. Um, and those are the individuals that are interacting with participants. Um, still, it's a very fragile thing. Trust is very fragile, despite the fact that the Strong Heart Study has had a a presence in the communities for 30 years, it's still a very fragile thing and it takes daily, monthly work uh, to maintain that trust. 
Um, just a brief story, if there's time. Um, when vaccines were first offered uh, in one of the centers of the Strong Heart Study, the, the field staff are all community members, but they've been working for their institution for a long time now, and the institution offered, the healthcare institution offered uh, vaccines, and the field staff were very hesitant. But when their tribal leaders said, oh, we have, the tribe now has vaccines it can administer, they went as fast as they could to get vaccinated. So clearly, they trusted their tribal leaders. They did not trust the institution they've been working for for quite some time. So trust is really fragile and, and really difficult to uh, maintain. We have about one minute. I'm going to see if Dr. Martin or uh, Ms. Israel have any final thoughts. I can say briefly, Edelman just did a trust barometer and uh, they do it every year. And the distrust is now society's default emotion. Nearly six in 10 say their default tendency is to distrust something. So we have immense uh, challenges to overcome. And I think when we look broadly at NCDs and infectious disease, we need to get together to try and drive that change to ultimately build those resilient systems and overcome those barriers such as distrust. Dr. Martin, we have, I guess that same one minute, we can just do it again. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think, you know, one of the principles in public health is community engagement. And as uh, previously stated, you have to meet, not patients, but you need to meet people where they are. And you have to be a more constant presence than um, one is used to thinking of in clinical medicine or in research. So the question is, how do you create those platforms to gain trust long before you want to do a study, long before you want to promote um, you know, safer uh, health behaviors, earning the trust, finding a safe place. And whether that is, uh, it can be churches, it can be public libraries, it can be places where your constituency it feels safe and they know the people who are there. Because that bridge takes time before you ever engage them uh, in the discussions you want to have to improve their lives. And so it is hard. It is, I think, for indigenous populations in the U.S., um, they are one of the best models for what it's like to do global health because they have been here far longer than we uh, in this room, and they have had a unique history and uh, one of the least, um, I think, um, behaviors on the part of our emerging country two, three hundred years ago was our engagement with native populations. So both in Alaska, Canada, the Arctic Circle, you have to include all of those really in our scope. And um, so th this is a difficult time, huge challenges, but I think on the other hand, uh, we are more sensitive to what we need to do now than ever in our history. We just need to make it happen at scale. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists and thank you to our um, audience here in person um, and back at home or virtually. We appreciate you and uh, your attention to this very important topic. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>